Hello everyone! In a previous video, we discussed how to estimate the amount of work an algorithm does by counting the number of operations in code. In this video, I want to take that idea one step further and talk about growth rate functions, algorithm analysis, and big O notation. Let's start with a review of counting operations. Here I have a simple function called printarray. It accepts an array of integers, one dimensional, and a size n, how many integers are in the array. Now we look at the body of this function and we count how many operations or steps or statements are in the function. So let's start with int i is assigned zero. That is one operation, one statement. Then we have a while loop with a Boolean condition i less than n. How many times does i less than n execute? Well, it'll execute to be true n times, and then it'll execute to be false one time. That's when i is no longer less than n, and we break out of the while loop. So next to i less than n, I'm going to write n plus one. In the body of the while loop, we have a cout statement. This cout statement will execute n times. And then we have our progress towards our Boolean condition being false, i plus assign 1. Because it's in the body of our while loop, that will execute n times, i plus assign 1 will execute n times. So now we sum up all of our counts to get what's called a growth rate function. The notation used for a growth rate function is capital T of n, and that would be 1 plus n plus 1 plus n plus n, which is 3n plus 2. If you'd like more practice with this idea of operation counting, I recommend checking out a previous video where I go through this with linear search. Now let's move on to the main event of today's video. How can we use this growth rate function in order to determine the efficiency of an algorithm? Let's title this section of our notes, Introduction to Algorithm Analysis. That'll be our formal title. In parentheses here, I'm gonna put our informal title, which is beyond the idea of it works. When we're first learning to code, it's hard enough just to get our code to produce the correct output. Once we get that, we're usually pretty excited and ready to move on to the next task or the next feature or the next problem. But now that we're gaining some experience with programming, algorithms, and problem solving, we want to go beyond simply, oh, our code works. It produces a correct result. And we want to start thinking about if we have two algorithms that both solve the same problem, but they're implemented slightly differently or maybe greatly differently, which one do we choose to use? Which one's, quote, better? So essentially, we're thinking about two things here, efficiency and elegancy. In efficiency, we're talking about the runtime or the memory usage. And when we're talking about something being elegant, we're talking about it adhering to a coding standard or being super readable or self-documenting, et cetera. So we're gonna focus on efficiency. So let's suppose that we have two algorithms and these two algorithms solve the exact same problem. But let's say one algorithm runs faster and or uses less memory. Well, we should probably use that one, right? So there's two dimensions here that I'm talking about. I'm talking about execution time. If that's faster, we call this efficiency analysis time complexity. 
And when we're talking about less memory, we're talking about space complexity. In this video, we're going to start with time complexity. So let's write a nice definition for time complexity that you can refer to later. The time complexity of an algorithm measures the amount of work, and I'm going to put work in quotes here because we already have an idea of work from our operation counting videos and our growth rate function that we saw in this video. So the amount of work the algorithm performs as a function of the size of the input. This part here is really important because of course our algorithm will do more work if its input is say larger. So we're not just going to have a time complexity that works possibly for all size of input. We'll have to express our time complexity in terms of the size of the input. So we will use the amount of work to determine this function, which is called a growth rate function. And thanks to our nice little demo we did at the beginning of the video, we already have a sense of what a growth rate function looks like and how we could derive one. So let's return to that example here. Let's say our growth rate function to give n is 3n plus 2. So in this case, n is our independent variable. It'll also be sometimes written as capital N, is the size of the input. And for this example, this was the size or the number of elements of an array. So if the array is really, really big, then the print array has to do a lot more work than if the array only has, say, one or two elements in it. All right, moving on to big O notation. Big O notation represents the order of an algorithm. So by order here, we mean a mathematical order. The most dominant term in the growth rate function after we've stripped the growth rate function of any constants and other terms. So back to our example here. If our growth rate function is t of n equals 3n plus 2, okay, the most dominant term between 3n and 2 is 3n. And then we strip out any constants. So there goes the 3. And that leaves us with n. And this is, in fact, the time complexity of our print array algorithm. Now, big O of n represents a whole family or class of algorithms called linear algorithms. Essentially, the amount of work these algorithms have to do is directly proportional to, or linear proportionally, to the size of the input. And I can write that down to help make it really clear. As n gets large, the impact of the three scaling factor and the two constant become insignificant. The work is linearly proportional 
to n. Now, in closing this video, I'd like to draw a chart here that presents the most common families or classes of algorithms grouped by their big O notation, their time complexity. So let's make a really big chart here. On the x-axis will be n, which we know is the size of our algorithm's input. And on the y-axis, we'll have the value of our growth rate function. So essentially, t of n. So let's draw a flat line here, a horizontal line. This line represents algorithms with constant time complexity, big O of one. An example would be, say, an algorithm that accepts an array, and no matter how big the array is, it always prints the first item. So it does the same amount of work regardless of how big or how small its input is. Constant time complexity, constant work. Next, and this isn't going to be perfectly drawn to scale, we have a logarithmic function. So big O of log base 2 of n. So this is the logarithmic family. An example of a algorithm with logarithmic time complexity is binary search. If you've studied binary search, you know that with each iteration or with each recursive call, the binary search algorithm halves the amount of space, the amount of memory that it's searching for a target in. That repeated halving gives us a nice growth rate function that's logarithmic. Next, we have big O of n. This is the linear time complexity family. And we just saw an example of that with print array. Another example would be linear search. Next, kind of a curve to this line here. This is big O of n log base 2 of n. This is the log linear family. And an example of log linear algorithms include quick sort and merge sort. These are pretty fast sorting algorithms. We also have sorting algorithms that are not as fast. These are big O of n squared or quadratic time complexity algorithms like selection sort, bubble sort, and insertion sort. Next, we have big O of n cubed. This is cubic time complexity. A classic example of this is matrix multiplication. With standard matrix multiplication, you have a for loop inside of a for loop inside of a for loop. So you've got double nested for loops, three for loops. And then the last line I'm going to draw here is a rapidly increasing line, which is going to represent big O of n factorial, big O of n to the n, big O of 2 to the n. These are all what we call exponential time complexity algorithms. And this family of algorithms, you want to avoid at all costs because even for small to medium sizes of n, these algorithms take a really, really, really long time to run. I mean, so long that these algorithms may not even finish within a year or a lifetime. So if at all possible, you want to try to avoid exponential algorithms. A classic example of an exponential algorithm is the Towers of Hanoi problem. If you haven't heard of this problem, no worries. 
Uh, it's typically introduced when you learn about recursion because it has a really, really beautiful recursive solution. Uh, it's essentially a game or a challenge where you try to move disks from one peg to another peg with some restrictions on how you can move the disks. Anyways, I'm going to summarize what we've just talked about by kind of highlighting the classes of algorithms that you want to avoid. So that would be any exponential algorithms or, you know, any polynomial algorithms too that have really high exponents because those can take a while to run for large sizes of n. In kind of the medium zone here, I'll do yellow, uh, you know, big O of n squared, uh, n log n. These aren't too bad depending on how big your input is and how long you have to run the algorithm. But if at all possible, we want algorithms to be big O of n or faster. Taking binary and linear search, for example, if your data is always sorted, that you definitely want to use binary search over linear search because you'll be able to find a target value much faster. But we know that keeping data in sorted order can incur a cost. Also, if our data isn't in sorted order and we need to sort it, if we haven't spent time to familiarize ourselves with the best algorithm for sorting or sorting our particular data, then we could end up with a big O of n squared. I'll mention too that big O constitutes the worst case for input and the algorithm. How long will it take? How much work does it have to do? There are other types of analysis uh, that are not big O notation that look at say best case scenario or average case scenario. And I highly recommend you continue your learning of algorithm analysis by looking beyond big O notation after you finish this video. Well, I hope this was helpful in connecting the operation counting to the idea of big O, which is a common concept that is learned when I'm beginning to program and moving beyond my algorithm works to talk about its efficiency. Thanks for watching.